Acts 4, 23 to 31 for a sermon I've entitled, A Plea for Persevering Grace. Follow along as I read. It says, when they had been released, this is Peter and John, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And then when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were to, uh, gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Losing their religion, why U.S. churches are on the decline. That was the headline for a recent article in the Guardian newspaper. In it, the author Adam Gabbett points to recent data which shows that younger Americans are not only leaving the church, but they're abandoning Christianity altogether. As recently as 1990, some 90% of Americans identified as Christian, but that number has dropped nearly a third down to a mere 64% today. In 2019, the last year that we have numbers for this, 3,000 new Protestant churches were opened, but 4,500 closed in the same year. Now the author points out that during the COVID crisis, many churches shut down went to online services, but when they reopened, a lot of churchgoers never returned. But the turning away from Christianity by young people started long before the COVID crisis. The rise of what's been called the nuns, those without a religion, has been going on for the last couple of decades. Why? Why are young people, even those raised in the church, dropping out and turning away? Well, according to Scott McConnell, who conducted a recent Lifeway survey, he said, the younger generation just doesn't feel that they're being accepted in the church environment and that some of their choices aren't being accepted by those at church. He said about a quarter of the young adults who dropped out of church said that they disagreed with the church's stance on political and social issues. Now, some people are alarmed at this development, convinced that it doesn't bode well for our nation for the future. Fewer people raised in church means that the basic understanding of morality, which was shared by the majority of Americans, will no longer be there. That explains all the culture wars that we have going on in our country today. Now others cheer this development, thinking that the more churches that close and the sooner Christianity disappears, the freer we'll all become. No longer restrained by restrictive sexual ethics, everyone will be free to do what's right in his own eyes. Now Voltaire, the skeptic, believed that Christianity would simply wither away. He predicted that 100 years after his death, the Bible would simply be a museum piece. Others, like Stalin and Mao, believe that Christianity should be stamped out by force and all the churches demolished. Well, whether the church waxes or wanes, increases or decreases, it will never go away because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Whatever opposition is brought against it, the church will continue to preach the gospel and bear witness to the truth. Now, the evidence for the statement that I just made is found throughout the book of Acts and certainly in our context today. For after being forbidden by the religious leaders to speak any more about Jesus and threatened if they continued to do so, the disciples not only refused to back down, but prayed that God would give them the grace to keep going and be even more bold in the proclamation of the gospel. Well, today to encourage you to stand for the truth of the gospel as we witness for Christ, I want to look at this portion of God's word. So why don't we pray? And get into the text. Our Father and God, I do pray for grace and mercy. This is going to be uh, extremely important in the years to come because the cost of becoming a Christian and proclaiming the truth is going up. So I pray that you'd prepare us for those days and do so by educating us through your word and seeing what there is for us today in the text. So bless us now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, four things I see in this text. First of all, there's a prophecy quoted, and that's verses 23 to 26. A prophecy quoted. Next, we find a prof the prophecy fulfilled, and that's 27 to 28. 
Third, we find the prayer requested, and that's 29 to 30. And then finally, in 31, the request granted. Now keep in mind where we are in this story. Peter and John had healed a man who had been born lame in the name of Jesus. With the crowd gathered around him to witness the event, Peter took the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. He indicted them for the part that they had played in the crucifixion of Jesus, but he also offered them forgiveness, not only for this sin, but for all sins, if they had simply trust in Christ as the payment for their sin. Christ crucified is the sacrifice for sin. Christ resurrected as a victor over death. That's the message the church is always to be proclaiming. But whenever you preach the good news, some people are going to get upset. And in this case, it was the religious leaders who Peter and John had, or were arrested by and thrown in jail until they could be interrogated the next day by the Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish council. Well, at this trial, the religious leaders demanded to know by what power and in whose name have you performed this miracle? They told them that it was by God's power in the name of Jesus, the same man that they had put to death just a couple months before. And what could the religious leaders do? They couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place, but they weren't going to allow Peter and John to keep spreading the message, so they demanded that they stopped and they threatened them if they continued. They thought that they would oppose truth with power. But folks, listen carefully. Truth is always more powerful than power. Finally, knowing they had no real charge against them, they let Peter and John go. And after they were freed, they went back to the other followers of Jesus. And that brings us to our first section. The prophecy quoted, and that's verses 23 to 26. We're going to look at that prophecy in just a minute, but for right now, let's note some things that happen here after John and Peter were let go. We read starting in verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Now, don't miss this important point. The opposition that the disciples faced was not coming from secular authorities, but from the religious establishment. Listen, the people who mount the strongest opposition to the spread of the gospel are not the drunks in the bar. All they want to do is drink. Rather, it's the people who themselves claim to be servants of God. I mean, didn't Jesus warn his disciples saying that they will put you out of the synagogues? In fact, the time is coming when anyone who puts you to death will think they're doing a favor for God. When Muslims behead converts to Christianity from Islam, they believe they're doing it with God's approval. When the Catholic Church burned Protestants at the stake, the leaders thought it was not only right, but pleasing to God. And of course, the worst situation of all is when the religion is wedded to the state and backed by the power of the government. The persecution of the Christians in the Persian Empire was at the behest of the Zoroastrian priests. Zoroastrianism was a state religion. Remember that scene in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, where the Apostle John sees a vision, quote, of a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that's covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet with glittering gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held in her cup, or in a, a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things in the filth of her idolatries. It says, the names were written on, a name was written on her forehead that was said, Mystery Babylon, the mother of prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. It says, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people the and the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns represents that last world empire that's going to be headed by the Antichrist. The woman riding it represents the false world religion. She's the dirty prostitute who contrasts to the pure bride of Christ found in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. This woman rides the beast because she's using the power of the beast to kill the followers of Jesus. False religion has always been the enemy of true religion. And if the devil cannot destroy the church from outside, he'll try to subvert it from within. I mean, warning of such spiritual saboteurs, the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. For such men... These are people in the church. For such men are deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Now, at this point, it was not yet subversion from within, but hostility from without, from the Jewish leaders. So after relating their experience to the rest of Jesus' followers, we read this. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voice with one accord and said, O Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in it. Now, I'm using the New American Standard Version, but I think here's a place where the ESV actually does a better job translating it. 
Instead of having, oh Lord, they put in sovereign Lord. Now the Greek word for Lord here is an unusual one. It's despotes, which is the word from which we get the English word despot. When we speak of a despot, we're usually speaking of some tyrannical ruler. But the Greek word has the idea of an absolute ruler, a powerful sovereign. So the religious leaders may have power, but the disciples were praying to the omnipotent, all-powerful God. The one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. Do you know how big our sun is compared to the earth? The sun is 864,400 miles across, 109 times the diameter of the earth. If the sun were the size of a beach ball, the earth would be the size of a BB. 1,300 1, earths could fit in the area of the sun. But how big is the largest star compared to the sun? Well, the star is UY Scuti, and it's 1,700 times larger than our sun. You could fit almost 5 billion suns the size of ours inside of that star. And by the way, do you know how many stars are in the universe? It's estimated that the number is 200 billion trillion. Think about that the next time you read Genesis 1.16, which says, and he made the stars also. Well, our government, allied with the Federal Reserve, big tech, and pharmaceutical companies, the World Economic Forum, and the United Nations may have power, great power, but God only is all-powerful. He's the creator and the sustainer of the universe, but it's not just that he has power, but that he's sovereign over all things. It's he who calls the shots. Yes, the religious leaders thought they were going to thwart the spread of the gospel, but God is not worried or surprised by this rebellion and hostility. The very opposition was prophesied a thousand years before by David. It says, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, the ser your servant, said this, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise of futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers were to, uh, gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now this quote comes from Psalm chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm. It speaks of an insurrection by rebels conspiring to throw off God's rule. The psalm goes on with a rebel saying this, Let us cast off their fetters and cast away their cords from us. Now, think about it. The nations today are certainly trying to cast off the moral fetters that God's placed on us, aren't they? Our nation in particular. He tells us that sex is supposed to be between one man and one woman committed to each other for life and marriage. No, we're going to engage in sex with anyone and in any way we want. Think of Jeffrey Epstein. He created us in his image. Male and female, he created us. No, I don't want to be a man. I want to be a woman. Think of Dylan Mulvaney. Be fruitful and multiply. No, reduce the population to save the planet. Don't have any children and abort those who are conceived. We will not have this God to rule over us, telling us what we can and cannot do. Well, that same psalm goes on to say this. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he speaks in his anger and he terrifies them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now the one who sits in heaven and laughs is God the Father. The one he's installed on Mount Zion is Jesus, his son. His son is set to inherit the nations and rule over them. That has not happened yet, but it will when Jesus returns. But that first part, the conspiring together of these wicked rebels, the disciples saw this as being fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus. And that brings us to our second point, the prophecy fulfilled. This is verses 27 to 28. Look what it says. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. I mean, can you successfully stage a coup against God? Can you outsmart him? Can you outmaneuver him? God is the cosmic chess master. The game always ends with him saying to his opponents, checkmate. By the way, do you know where that phrase checkmate comes from? It comes from the Persian words Shah Mat, like the Shah of Iran. Shah means king, and Mat means dead. So it means your king is dead. 
Well, when Jesus was crucified, they nailed a sign above him on his cross that said, King of the Jews. And when he breathed his last, the religious leaders thought it was checkmate for Jesus. But oh, foolish rebels, don't you know that he's not merely a king? He's king of kings and lord of lords? I mean, every Easter we sing that song, crown him the lord of life who triumphed over the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death might die. Silly rabbit. Sovereignty isn't for man. Sovereignty belongs to God. You think you planned out Christ's death? Ha! Huh. God planned out your planning of Christ's death. You could no more thwart the plan of God than a character in a novel can thwart the will of the author. Well, the religious leaders may have hatched a plot, but working behind and through their evil machinations was the sovereign God of the universe who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I was talking to Dina church last week, she mentioned one of the women who comes to her Bible study is in a church where the pastor started a new sermon series. I think it was something along this line. Lies I was told in church. Now, according to the pastor, one of those lies is that God always accomplishes his will. He said that uh, he knew that wasn't true because he wanted to get a scholarship one time for some school, and he was sure that God wanted him to get that, but it didn't happen, so it proves that God doesn't always accomplish his will. Is he right? Does God sometimes find himself singing the songs of the Rolling Stones? You can't always get what you want? No. Job said this to God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job 42, 2. The arrogant king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was humbled by God, losing his mind so that he thought he was an animal. I've got to put a little parenthesis in this. There's a guy working for Joel. I think he attends the Frederick School. And uh, there's a girl in the school who believes she's a cat. So when she walks down the hallway, she hisses at people. <laughs> well, this kid wasn't buying it, so when she hissed at him, he went Roof! and barked it back. He got in trouble. I'm going to put a little, another parenthesis in here. There's a reason you need to be serious about learning your faith right now and getting solid in it because the times are going to get difficult very quickly. And Jesus said when the persecution comes, many will fall away and you don't want to be one of them. Well, he spent seven years eating grass and lowing like a cow. The king was crazy. He says in his own words, but at the end of this period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. But he does according to his will with the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? It's not ultimately Putin or Zelensky who's going to decide what the border of Russia and Ukraine will be. It's God, because Paul told us, or told the philosophers in Athens, the God who made the world and all that's in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made, listen to this, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Acts 17, 24 to 26. Proverbs 16, 33 says, We may throw the dice, but it's the Lord who determines how they fall. From the smallest thing, the throwing of dice, to the greatest thing, the crucifixion of Jesus, God determines all things that come to pass. But hold it, Pastor. Are you saying that that includes evil things, like the Holocaust? I mean, how can you say that God determined that? Wouldn't that make God responsible for sin? Well, of course, God is not more responsible for sin than we are. But let me ask you a question. Think about the horrors of the Holocaust and what was done. Could God have stopped it from happening? Couldn't he have sent 10,000 angels to wipe out the German army and slay the Nazi perpetrators of genocide? Obviously, he could have, but he didn't. Which means, for his own inscrutable reasons, he allowed for, planned for, these great evils to happen. Now, some people say, oh, but God has given man free will, and he respects our free will. He doesn't force us to make choices, and if we use our free will to commit evil acts, well, that's just the price we have to pay. But let me ask this question. That doesn't get God off the hook. 
Think about it. why did God respect the free will choices of the Nazi guards who put people in the gas chambers rather than the Jewish people who didn't want to go into the gas chambers? You can't get around this conundrum. God either wants to stop evil but doesn't have the power to do so, impossible because he's omnipotent, or he has the power but for his own reasons he chooses not to, to intervene at times but instead uses evil people and the wicked things that they do to fulfill his own purposes. Remember Joseph? After his father died, his brothers were afraid that he would take revenge on him. And he said, look, when you did that, when you sold me into slavery like that, you did that for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The same act. When Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, conspired to put Jesus to death, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, this was the confidence of the early Christians facing persecution, that nothing, absolutely nothing, could come into their life that's outside of the sovereign, predetermined plan of God. And so Christians can rest at peace with promises like the one in Romans 8.28 that says, And we know that God causes all things to work for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God couldn't make a promise like that if he wasn't the one who was ultimately in control of everything that happens in the world. Do you remember even with Job, when Satan was tormenting him, God put limits on what the devil could do to him. Like the Veggie Tale cartoon says, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. Yes, God is bigger than the boogeyman, and he's watching, watching over you and me. Well, that brings us to our third point, though, the prayer requested. This is verse 29 to 30. Now today, if this would happen to us, when we were trying to share our faith, we might file a lawsuit for the violation of our First Amendment rights. We might go to a Christian radio station and be interviewed and relate what happened to us. At the very least, we'd tell everyone we know how we were treated wrongly. None of those things would be incorrect to do. But that's not what these early Christians did. What did they do? When faced with threats by those in power, the first thing they did was what every Christian should do. They prayed. Look what it says in verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They asked God to take note of their threats, but they didn't ask him to take down their enemies. They aren't calling for fire from heaven to come down and destroy them or a couple of she-bears come out and eat them. What they asked for is greater boldness in their witness so that your bond servants can speak the word with all confidence. Listen to the words of Tony Morita from his commentary on this passage. He says this, Suffering is unavoidable for the Christian. In every age, the gospel always cuts across cultural convictions and the norms in some way. Paul would later write that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Thinking about all of this in light of the freedoms that we in the United States enjoy, I wonder how our prayers might differ from those offered by the early church in view of the American dream ide ideology that permeates our culture. Could it be that our prayers are more about comfort being maintained and enhanced than God's greater glory being displayed? More than ease of life, these Christians wanted Christ to be proclaimed so that God would be glorified. That brings us to our last point, though, the request granted. Now, with some prayer requests, you have to wait a long time. <laughs> I have to put a little note in here. There's a lady who came to my Bible study a number of years ago. And uh, she was from a Catholic background. And, but she, she did not know the Lord. But she came and she listened. And just within about a week, she ended up getting saved. And so that was pretty exciting. But then she started praying for her husband. Oh, she said, and I remember her telling me, she said, oh, I hope God answers my prayer. I've been praying for my husband for two whole weeks every day. You know what's ironic? God saved her husband at the next Bible study. Now some of you are thinking, uh, I've been praying for my family members for years. Well, sometimes we have to wait, and other times the answers come quite quickly, and this is one of the cases. When faced with threats from those in power, they prayed, right? They did that, and the request was granted. It says this in verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. 
They asked for confidence in proclaiming the truth and asked God uh, th that he would continue to back up their message with displays of power. One immediate display came with an earthquake of a sort, but more importantly, it says again that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. That's what the American church needs to turn around this country. First of all, we've got to get the gospel right. But secondly, it has to be proclaimed by Christians who are bold enough to tell the truth in a society that's increasingly feeding on lies. We need confidence in the gospel that it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And we need to proclaim that gospel whether people listen or refuse, whether they embrace it or shun it. And if the time comes, which it looks like it will shortly, where the authorities forbid us to speak anymore in Jesus' name, we have to be willing to say, whether it's right in the sight of God, to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. But as for us, we cannot stop speaking about the things we've seen and heard. Rise up, O man of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. May God give us the grace to proclaim the truth. Because if we don't do it, it's not going to be done. And we're going to have very dark days ahead. Let's pray. Our Father in God, Paul told us we're supposed to be lights in the midst of a uh, wicked and perverse generation. And that's what we feel. That's what we see. And the bizarre stories that come out and, you know, the shootings. I think there was four mass shootings just in the last week and a half. We see what it's like to be a nation under your judgment as according to Romans chapter 1. But Father, as the prophet Habakkuk said, he said, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. And we're asking the same for us. Lord, not only for us that you'd uh, protect us and give us grace, that doesn't mean we won't suffer, but protect us in our faith. And Father, we do pray that we would get opportunities to witness to people because these dark days are coming upon us quickly and we already see that the sun is setting. And so we're going to need much help from you, but we know that we will get that help from you because you have committed yourself to your people and you've shown that through sending your son to be the payment for our sins. So bless us now. Give grace. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.